Sometime after sunset, a group of men gathered together in Kandahar to savor the moment they made history. Televisions had been banned in Afghanistan, but these men were honored guests. Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda faithful were there to watch the horror of 9-11 unfold. What Al-Qaeda called the Manhattan Raid. So the West invaded Afghanistan. There was a belief it could be done quickly uh, with a very light footprint. Uh, we could be in and we could be out again. And we ended up uh, doing neither one thing nor the other. Instead, 47 nations, America and Britain especially, have been sucked ever deeper into a quagmire. Oh, I used to ask myself every time I went to Afghanistan, what are we doing here? In the first of three programs marking 10 years of war in Afghanistan, I've been examining some of the key decisions that have shaped the conflict. A conflict that's cost many thousands of lives, including more than 370 British servicemen and women. With the right attention, the right strategy, and the right resources, the war would be over and most of our boys would be home. But we didn't do it. It's important to give people a clear idea that there is an end to this. So, will the death of Osama bin Laden, who started the Afghan war, bring us any closer to an end? Two years before 9-11, Afghanistan's UN envoy arrived in New York. There, he handed in his resignation. I went to the Security Council and said, look, I have done everything I know, and it has got us nowhere. I haven't got anywhere because you are not supporting me. You are not interested in Afghanistan. Uh, but you are wrong. Afghanistan had become a pariah state. The Taliban government had allowed al-Qaeda to establish its base there, from where Osama bin Laden had declared a holy war on Jews and Christians. The Taliban shared with al-Qaeda its medieval version of Islam. The United Nations had been trying to persuade the Taliban to kick out al-Qaeda. Their envoy had had a rare meeting with the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, a veteran of the war against the Russian invaders, of the 1980s. Very shy man. Uh, he had uh, lost an eye and he was, he was very much aware of that, so he kept you know, always playing with his hand like this. Uh, very, very soft-spoken. I told him, look, you know, this group have an agenda that has nothing to do with, uh, with Afghanistan and that will create a lot of problems for you. He said, Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, he is our guest. In Afghanistan, bin Laden was more than just a guest. As a wealthy Saudi, he helped bankroll the Taliban regime. Mullah Omar refused to disown his friend and benefactor. Lakhtar Brahimi's mission had failed. He warned the Security Council that by ignoring Afghanistan, they were storing up trouble. You are wrong to think that you know, this is a small country, a faraway country. You know, what happens there is irrelevant. It will blow in, in our faces. The impact of 9-11 cannot be understated. It was the deadliest attack against America in its history. With nearly 3,000 dead, it was inevitable that America would strike back. The people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Prompting America to 
to invade Afghanistan was exactly what Osama bin Laden was hoping for on September 11th. His son has told us, in retrospect, my father's dream was to get America to invade Afghanistan. To me, it's just common sense, though. Obviously, you gotta go get the guy. America gave the Taliban every chance to avoid war. All they had to do was hand over bin Laden. If bin Laden's the guy we want, send the assassination team out and get him. It was a serious effort to persuade the Taliban, you do not want to go down with Al-Qaeda. If you'll hand these guys over, uh, our war isn't with you. The Taliban response was that their ancient hospitality code trumped all other considerations. It was a no, uh, that we're not going to separate ourselves from our traditional hospitality welcoming of guests. It's hard for us to understand that when you're dealing with a, with a man like Osama bin Laden. It happens like that. It happened like that. Yes. The life of the guest is protected by the lives of the hosts. Nearly four weeks after 9-11, America's patience ran out. The president told his generals to unleash holy hell. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. America was determined not to get bogged down in Afghanistan, so there was no large ground invasion, no heavy armor. Instead, America relied on CIA operatives, precision, speed, just 1,800 troops, and buying up Afghan militias. Its plan was war light. We sent in 20 or 30 CIA officers with several million dollars in walking around money and bought the Northern Alliance over to our side. The Northern Alliance was a coalition of warlords which had once ruled much of Afghanistan. They were a ragtag militia, now aligned to the world's most sophisticated fighting force. In the 1990s, the Northern Alliance had lost to the Taliban in a civil war costing tens of thousands of lives. The tables were now turning. On the 13th of November 2001, just five weeks after the invasion, the Northern Alliance captured the capital, Kabul. It looked like the war was over. That's not what Osama bin Laden thought was going to happen. He thought it was going to be a long, protracted guerrilla struggle. He was surprised. The celebrations in Kabul concealed a mass of underlying tribal and sectarian tensions. The Northern Alliance represented ethnic groups in the north. The Taliban were drawn from the majority Pashtun of the south. To avoid another inter-ethnic civil war, Afghanistan needed a leader acceptable to both the north and the south. That leader was a Pashtun who teamed up with US special forces at a secret air base near the Pakistan border. His name was Hamid Karzai. In 2001, my mission was to link up with Hamid Karzai. I, I liked him immediately. I, I can't say I've worked with uh, many Afghan warlords before, so maybe they're all uh, equally personable. But Karzai was a, uh, a very modest man, uh, very polite. Captain Amarine's mission was to help Karzai raise an army against the Taliban. The Taliban had retreated south and were regrouping for a last stand in their spiritual home in Kandahar. <laughs> During a chaotic day of fighting, Karzai and Amarine learned that hundreds of Taliban fighters 
were closing in on. Basically, as all hell was breaking loose and we're waiting for the Taliban to overrun our location and kill everybody, uh, Karzai was uh, standing out there in the street, calmly directing people and trying to gather up uh, uh, guerrillas to fight with us. He, he was definitely cool under pressure. We received a phone call late at night. Uh, everybody was asleep except uh, me and Karzai. After he hung up, it, it was like, you know, oh, who is that? Uh, and uh, he says to me, oh, that was an intermediary from Mullah Omar. And it, I kind of did a double take. I'm like, uh, what did Mullah Omar want? The Taliban leader wanted to explore the terms of a surrender. Provided the Taliban returned peacefully to their homes, the war would be over. At least, that's what the Taliban say Hamid Karzai promised Mullah Omar. He promised to him that this is your country, to live in your country peacefully with all your natural rights and the human rights. But they were not allowed to live peacefully in this country. Washington rejected a deal with the Taliban. Their Afghan mission was kill or capture, and they made no distinction between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Do you think that was a mistake? I do. Certainly below the level of Mullah Omar uh, to have considered a political approach which would have offered the Taliban possibilities to participate in the political process, provided that they would cut their ties with international terrorism I think that history will judge that a missed opportunity. Because Washington wanted to get in and out of Afghanistan swiftly, there were few US troops to chase the fleeing Al-Qaeda and Taliban leaders. The hunt for Osama bin Laden took special forces to a network of caves close to the Pakistan border. This top hill, very top up there. That's supposedly where uh, Bin Laden's hanging out. The Americans had deployed less than a hundred troops with which to seal all routes out of these vast mountains. Bin Laden slipped away, as did the Taliban leaders. We took our eye off the ball and gave Osama Bin Laden, Mullah Omar, a remarkable second chance. And in one of the most brilliant military comebacks, of modern times, the Taliban went from the ashes of defeat to being on the outskirts of Kabul in a matter of less than a decade. Any hope that the Afghan war would be brief vanished when bin Laden and Mullah Omar slipped across the border into Pakistan's Pashtun tribal lands. Greeting the fugitives were not only friends and family, but also elements of Pakistan's military intelligence, sympathetic to al-Qaeda, and who'd also helped the Taliban win the Afghan civil war in the 1990s. They wanted the government in Kabul that was under their influence and control, and which was not under the influence of India. They had given them their first uh, batch of serious weaponry, uh, ammunition, uh, they, uh, uh, money. There were Pakistani military officers who were working and serving with the Taliban. After 9-11, Pakistan's president, Pervez Musharraf, bowed to American pressure and promised to cut his government's ties to the Taliban. The Bush administration was ecstatic when Musharraf agreed to switch sides after September 11th. President Bush is a man who believes very strongly in personal relationships. And he believed that he and General Musharraf had developed a strong bond between them. Many Al-Qaeda members were arrested. Not so the Taliban high command. 